thank you. So, um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I, uh, it's, it is a pleasure to introduce my wife, Dr. Diana Schwartzbein, who is a, m many of you may know her by reputation from her books, The Schwartzbein Principle. Um, D Diana is a, an endocrinologist by training um, and a physician who really has been very forward thinking over the years in her approach to metabolic health. Um, and she will be speaking with you tonight on um, what we are calling Survival of the Smartest. Uh, the Survival of the Smartest is the title of Diana's next book, uh, which we are working on together and have been for some time. And, and uh, I'm not going to give you any sort of a date on when it might be out because then we'll, it'll put us under ridiculous pressure um, and we can do that for ourselves. So anyway, ho hopefully soon, like maybe next year, uh, we'll be able to share the book. In the meantime, we're sharing with you this evening thoughts and information that, that are part of what, what we're saying, what we're saying in the book and your, your feedback, um, your thoughts on this are very, very much appreciated. So um, where I'd like to begin um, is this number right here. 857,995. Anyone want to posture a guess as to what that number might represent? Heart disease deaths. What's that? Heart disease, Heart disease deaths. Um, it, it, it very well could be over the, over the course of some time. What this is, is I, I went on to, um, I went on Amazon.com um, this morning to find out how many books there are on health. There's the answer. So one of the things that I, I think that we can, we can glean from looking at this number is, well, first of all, that's a lot of books. Um, secondly, they don't all agree with each other. There is a tremendous diversity and divergence of opinion out there, of, and, and also a great diversity of facts, if you will, um, that are represented in these books. And frankly, as, as we know, because we've read some of them, um, some of them are just plain wrong. Many of them just simply take different approaches to understanding health. The, the other thing it tells us, besides the fact that there are a lot of books and a great difference of opinion, is there must be a tremendous degree of interest out there among the public, or we wouldn't have 857,995 books published because publishers aren't, aren't silly. They just, just wouldn't do it. So we do know that a, a fairly common desire among a lot of people is to live a long and healthy life, and they're willing to do something to make that happen, namely seeking information trying to understand in order to make good decisions. So um, we, we start with that fact and then proceed to the, uh, the, the, rec the recognition of the fact that in this country in which we've published 857,995 books on health, we have a health problem. We have a health crisis, and I think many would acknowledge, in the fact that um, we're, we spend in this country more money per capita on health care than any other country, and yet we have more health problems, more disease, more people living more years of their life in an, unhe in an unhealthy state. Um, and I, I won't bother you. You're, you're all obviously and certainly very focused on health and, and issues around health, so I won't take your time to quote statistics. We all know obesity is pandemic. We know that uh, heart disease, Alzheimer's, dementia, um, cancer, et cetera, are rampant in this society, despite the fact that we, we spend the amount of money that we spend and, and we have as much information available on health as we have. In fact, we, to, how, how do we account for this? Well. The way, that, the way that we account for it um, is to say that, look, times have changed. Th think back as far back as you, can, as you can conjure to how people lived and how people died. There was a time when we died from factors stemming from our external environment, right? So we died from famine and we died from pestilence and storms and the elements and woolly mammoths running us down and tearing us apart. And we died from infectious disease. Um, and this was the case for a long, long time. Point is, we died from elements that are within our, our, our external environment. And now, what we find is that natural selection is extinct. So, th so think about it. natural selection basically was the process of evolution, adaptation to one's environment that enabled one to live the, you know, it was the survival of the strongest, right? The survival of the fittest. Those who could adapt and change their colors or change their reaction time or change their diet, et cetera, are those who survived in their environment. Today, things are different. Today, we kill ourselves. 
And I, I say that it's a, a little bit glib, but the fact is what, what is happening now is we're not dying from elements that are coming from our external environment. What we die from today are the degenerative diseases of aging. So we're talking about heart disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, dementia, osteoporosis, stroke. These are, these are all the diseases that now kill us since we aren't run down by woolly mammoths and we're not starving to death again, and we're talking in the developed world here. So think about it. Where do these diseases come from? There's nothing external about it. There is a day in our lives when, take someone who has diabetes or cancer or heart disease, there was a day when that person didn't have that disease. And then there's a day when, when she or he does. And, and none of it really has to do very much with external environment. I mean, we can, we can certainly, we're impacted by toxicity and elements of that nature. But what I'm, the, the point that I'm making and that Dr. Schwartzbein will certainly uh, expound upon, and I, I think very convincingly, is that where this comes from is our physiology, our in, what I'm calling our internal environment. So in large measure, we're not living up to our genetic potential. And, and I think most people here know that there are, there are human beings who have lived to be well over 100. I think 122 is the current record of women in France. Uh, I don't know if that's been uh, exceeded at this point. There are an increasing number of you know, centenarians, but not very many. The fact of the matter is that we can, it's been proven time and time again, we can live to be well over 100 years of age, and yet, People are dying in their 60s, their 70s, and their 80s, having lived a third, 70, maybe 80% of their, of their potential lifespan. Um, so the next question is why? And the answer to why is it really comes down to, and this, this is entirely the focus of Dr. Schwartzbein's presentation to you this evening, what, what kills us is not our external environment, it's our internal environment. It, it is our physiology, and our physiology is responding to, um, is a function of the decisions that we make, the habits that we have. And when I talk about habits and decisions, they're really the same thing. It, it may be a habit. You may, you may go to the gym every morning before you have breakfast. You've done it every year for, you know, every day for years. That's a habit. Well, in fact, if you're doing it every day, it's, you've, you've made a decision to continue to do it. So uh, let, let's consider for purposes of this evening at least that habits and decisions are the same thing. Habits are decisions that we make and we just don't pay a lot of attention to them. Um, so, so really what's happening is in this modern world, people do want to live longer. They're making an effort to get information. Um, yet they're still making bad decisions. Uh, we can just simply look back to the, the, the sources of information that are out there and how people interpret and apply that information. And those quote unquote bad decisions undermine our health. In fact, we've moved from the point at which we are in, in the mode of survival of the strongest or survival of the fittest to now it really is survival of the smartest. Those people who really understand physiology, how the body works, um, and that's why we're here this evening, and, he, and the person who can really give you that information and I think some different perspectives on how the body works, hopefully stimulate some thought and some conversation, um, and maybe a change in a few habits or decisions, uh, whichever you want to call it, um, Dr. Diana Schwartzbein. Well, that's the first time that Jonathan has introduced me. I kind of like it. <laughs> Can you hear me back there? Great, 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 great. Okay. Um, well, I want to dig right in because I have a lot to talk about, and usually I'm very long-winded. So at some point, too, if I have forgotten to give you a break, raise your hand, okay? And we will have a 20-minute break somewhere in my, you know, five-hour talk. Just kidding. Oh, went the wrong way. Okay. So as Jonathan mentioned to you, we are in the middle of the book, Survival of the Smartest. And basically, these are the core messages that I want to impart on you, not only today, but in that book. And I'm not making a plug for that book right now, because as he said, it's not written, and we're not going to put stress on ourselves. But I really want you to understand and take home today that we have a very high degree of control over our own health. That means you have control over your own health. And today, I'm hoping to teach you some of the fundamentals of how to take that control. Okay? And it's never too late. That's the good news. When I say you are your metabolism, I'm going to talk about metabolism today in um, metabolic terms, so you understand what that is, and I'll give you a hint. It's not about how thin or heavy you are. Um, informed decisions. Obviously, again, survival of the smartest. I think if you have the knowledge, 
you will make the right decisions. And when you start reading a lot of these books that are coming out on health, it'll give you a foundation to throw out you know, some of the bad information. I mean, there might be a book that has a really a lot of great information, but maybe some bad information in it. And I'm hoping that, you know, you're going to start to think about it in terms of metabolism to say, hmm, is that a good idea? For instance, the paleo diet. How many of you are on paleo? Okay. Well, today you're going to hear about why that's so terrible for you. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> And actually, to be honest with you, it's one of the incentives of me writing my fifth book on health because I went, oh, no, not again. You know, we're going off in the weeds, okay, and we need to get back into balance. All right, and then um, science is the ultimate truth. I am an endocrinologist, which means I study hormone systems, but hormone systems are all about biochemistry. So really, this is the truth about biochemistry, and we're going to talk a lot about biochemistry today. And, of course, the 360-degree integrated view. What I mean by that is, you know, we can't talk about the body and compartments. We're not going to talk about brain health, and then we're not going to talk about heart health, and we're not going to talk about metabolism as far as diabetes is concerned. Your body is one thing, okay? So this is about a, for lack of a better term, a holistic approach to thinking about yourself and your, and your health. And one of my favorites, of course, is treat the cause, not the symptoms. So a lot of people get symptoms like headaches and heartburn, or they get conditions like high cholesterol, or maybe they end up with diseases like high blood pressure, and what are we doing? We're throwing drugs at these problems. And we're just trying to mitigate a symptom without really trying to understand, why do I have any of this? Okay? Or even worse, sometimes you know, people get heartburn, and they actually think it's no big deal. Oh, I can just take an antiacid for that. Well, that symptom is telling you that you're on fire and something else is going on in your system. So we don't want to ignore the early signs and symptoms. We actually want to go back and say, okay, where's that heartburn coming from? Okay, why do I have it? And there's many causes of heartburn, by the way. So it's not going to be one thing. Um, going on, disease is a continuum. You don't, you're not healthy one day and sick the next. Okay. Though I've had a lot of patients come to see me, and they basically come in and they say, you know, I can remember when I got sick, and they actually give me a date and a time. Okay. Well, that's not when they got sick. That's when their body completely decompensated. So it was trying to compensate for them for a lot of years for what was going on, and then one day it said, I can't do this anymore, and now you have a disease. So I do want you to think of health first, then it starts to fall apart. You get some symptoms, which are warning signals. But most people just treat those with medications or ignore them, and the physiology continues, and that leads to conditions. And the same thing happens with conditions, because now we actually can put a name to it. Oh, a condition like hypertension, for instance. And so we start to treat hypertension without saying, well, why do I have hypertension? And hypertension over a long period of time, again, treated or not treated, that physiology that caused it is still continuing, more than likely, and that leads to chronic disease, and then, of course, chronic disease leads to the demise of the individual. So it's a continuum, and we're going to talk more about that. Now, metabolism is basically all about building and using, which I'm going to talk about, and what regulates these biochemical reactions in your body are your hormones. And hormones are chemical communicators, which, again, I'll get into a little bit more in a minute. And the good news about all this is that even though your hormones regulate your metabolism, you regulate your hormones. Okay. Now, of course, your hormone systems have to be intact for that to happen, and we're going to talk about you know, hormone therapy when they're not intact. But in general, it's really up to you and what your decisions are, what your habits are on a day-to-day -day basis. You're going to start taking over, giving your body the signals it needs in order to be healthy. That's what this talk is about today. Therefore, you have a high degree of control over your own health. So the good news is there's only a few things that we have to look at. We only have to look at nutrition, sleep and stress, chemicals, exercise, and hormone balancing therapy if needed. Not everybody needs hormones at any given moment. So again, you don't want to take a hormone if you don't need it because that will cause a hormone imbalance and lead to disease. 
So we want to be judicious about who's going to take hormones. So when I say you are your metabolism, what am I talking about? Well, metabolism is the sum total of all of your biochemistry. And there are all kinds of building reactions that occur in your body, and there's all kinds of using reactions that occur in your body. And when I say using, I mean function, right? So on a day-to-day -day basis, you are doing things. Right? You're not just sitting around like a lump on the log. You're actually active. You're engaging. You're thinking. You're doing. You're moving. Whatever you're doing. Like right now, me doing this, that's using. Okay? <laughs> and by the way, you can only be using or building at any given moment. You're really not using and building at any given moment. Okay? And actually, this gives me a, a chance to just stop for a moment. If I could get everybody just to stand up for a minute, if you don't mind. And stretch, I like that, okay? Yeah, that feels better, right? <laughs> All right, now you're gonna sit down and we're gonna do this periodically and, you're, and when we get to the point uh, in the talk, I will tell you why I'm asking you to do this, okay? Thank you for doing that with me. All right, so in general, in order to stay healthy, this is the whole crux of, of what you need to be doing, you actually have to, on a day-to-day -day basis, rebuild and restore and replenish what you use, okay? And I can, I can hope you can imagine that if all I did was use and use and use and use and there was no rebuilding involved, I wouldn't be around very much, okay, to, to use again tomorrow, right? <laughs> okay, so we really, again, want to talk about the balance between rebuilding and restoring and then functioning and using and doing what I want to be doing. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. So again, if you use more than build and time goes on, you're going to break down, right? Okay. And again, that, again how, what am I using? I'm using up functional biochemicals. What are those? Well, neurotransmitters are functional biochemicals, right? Digestive enzymes. And in fact, any enzyme in your body is a functional biochemical. Hormones are functional biochemicals. You don't eat hormones, you make them, right? So you're gonna have to rebuild your hormones so that your hormones then tell your body what to do, okay? So that you can function and use, and then you wanna replace everything that you've just used. So there are structural chemicals in your body. What are those? Bones, right? Muscles, all your cells and organs, your hair, your skin, your nails, right? You can think of everything that you can kind of tangibly touch. Um, then there's function. Again, these are the things like antibodies to help me fight off infections and the hormones and the enzymes of the bodies. Um, all of the cytokines of the system, okay, in your system, all that kind of stuff. And then there's energy biochemicals. So now it's the glucose and the fat we're going to use to drive all of these reactions of using and building. So those are the three types of chemicals in the body. And we have to step away from just thinking of energy in and energy out. Because energy in and energy out is only talking about one of those, those biochemicals. And that's the energy biochemicals, right? So how many of you, um, I don't know how to say this, uh, and, but how many of you are under the impression still that it's all about calories in equals calories out to keep you thin? Yay, that makes me happy. <laughs> um, so, so for years, and this is still what's going on today, okay, we'll take somebody like a type 2 diabetic who has insulin resistance, and you're going to hear you're going to actually learn today what that actually means in biochemical terms, because I'm going to show you slides on what is known about the intracellular mechanisms that are occurring in insulin resistance. But in general, we take this person with insulin resistance, and that's a pretty damaged metabolism, and we tell the individual who's usually overweight that all they have to do is lose weight. If they lost weight, they'd be healthy, right? That's what they say always over and over again. And how do you take somebody with a damaged metabolism and get them to lose weight? You have to pretty much starve them or you gotta have to over-exercise them. I mean, you're really pushing on the chemistry to make that happen. And when the, you do that, you're causing this person to break down. So you're breaking down, you're not building when you do that. So that's 
actually going to perpetuate the insulin resistance, which is what we're going to talk about today a little further. Okay, so the other thing that you want to think about since we are now living long enough, right, we're living long enough to age, okay, and so therefore we are dying from aging, really, okay, and that's normal. We're all going to die from aging. That's not, I'm not here to tell you how you're going to live forever, okay, <laughs> but what I am here to do is to say slow down accelerated metabolic aging. Don't speed that process up. It's coming anyway. Okay, and what you don't want to do is, is putting your foot on the accelerator and, and pushing yourself into the aging process, which again, you're going to learn. But anyway, in, def in the terms of definition, metabolically, we all age because we lose the ability to rebuild as well as we once could, and that is normal aging. Okay, so if my then, if I'm talking about metabolism and I'm saying keep your building and your using in balance, if you are doing things that are speed, are causing you to use more than build, you are accelerating your aging. Can you follow that with me? Okay. All right, so that brings us to informed decisions, right? So I'm just, I'm telling you that it is your habits that control your hormones. It's your hormones that control your metabolism. It's your balanced metabolism that keeps you healthy. So really it is what you're doing every moment of every day. And you have to start thinking in those terms. And, and usually when I get to this part of my talk, everybody gasps because they think of everything they've done, okay? But we wanna go forward, okay? You still can start right now learning the things that you need to do to keep your metabolism in balance. And we're going to talk about those at the end of the talk. Now, another interesting thing, and I've heard this all the time, I've, I've been in practice now for 25 years with my patients, and a lot of times I'll hear, if I ask patients about habits or what they're doing, they always say, I listen to my body, okay? And, and I love that, except sometimes your body tells you the wrong things, okay? <laughs> You know, people say, I don't eat till I'm hungry, so they might skip breakfast and lunch and not eat till dinner. You know, that's not a good thing. So what you have to understand is the body is not here to make you, it's not here to tell you when you're doing something wrong. It's here to compensate for you, okay? So early on, when you are, let's say, skipping breakfast every day, Okay, and yet thinking you're functioning because you've got good energy and your mind is working and, you know, you're going about your day. Um, your body's going, oh my God, you know, she skipped breakfast again. Emergency, emergency, emergency. Inside, your body's compensating for that. It is breaking you down so that you do not become hypoglycemic. Because hypoglycemia, or low blood sugar, is not compatible with acute life. Okay, and we're going to talk about the hormones that get activated when that happens. So now that I said that, how many of you um, skip breakfast? Oh, yeah, hold on. Okay, so, and for years? Yeah, okay. And do you also drink coffee in the morning to get yourself going? Yeah, so skipping breakfast and drinking coffee? Okay, that's two using against zero building, okay? <laughs> so already a misbalance, but you had a question. Oh, so sorry. Hold on one second. So, so that everyone can get... Am I on? Okay. All right. Thanks. You need to use a microphone for every question. Okay. Cool. Uh, so I was just thinking of uh, skipping breakfast, you know, in a week or two and seeing, trying to do the intermittent fasting and seeing if that's a good uh, strategy and, you know... Uh, I just know you're saying that... Uh, it's not. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you're going to leave today knowing why it's not. Okay. okay? I'm going to tell you right now it's not. Okay. Okay, but now we're going to go through the chemistry of why that's so. Okay. Perfect. Okay? But yeah, I'm glad that you were thinking about it and haven't done it yet so we can stop that aging process. <laughs> okay. So again, you know, if you do skip breakfast, you actually can feel better. You can actually get more energy doing that. And in fact, sometimes people say, well, I skip breakfast because when I eat, it makes me tired and I can't think and I get fuzzy headed. Okay? We'll talk about how you already have a compromised metabolism if, if skipping, I mean, excuse me, if eating breakfast makes you feel bad. Or you might be choosing the wrong foods. That's always the other side of that. But in general, we don't get immediate feedback, so we develop habits. Okay? Another bad habit would be over-exercising. 
which we're going to get to. So anything that I do that keeps my heart rate up for a long period of time, and I do that continuously, especially if I don't eat breakfast, because I heard the tennis pro here <laughs> skipping breakfast, and obviously then you're on the court. Um, again, you're going to be in using mode, okay? And we're going to go over the hormones that go up in the, in, in the biochemistry behind that, so you know that what I'm just telling you is a fact. That's all it is, okay? All right, so in order to make good decisions then, since your body's not going to tell you, and it's going to compensate for you whether you like it or not, um, then there has to be knowledge and awareness, right? And you do really have to have accurate information, and you need to know how it works, because only then can you make the decisions for yourself that are going to keep you healthy. And when the next fad diet comes along and you read the book on that, you're going to go, hmm, does this diet make me build or use? Okay? Does it balance me out or does it cause more using than building? And I hope you're going to get out of this talk that any time you're using more than building, you are breaking down. And since that's what aging is all about, you're actually accelerating your aging. And yes, this is the weirdest thing of all, it feels good to break down feels great to break down until you're broken, and then it feels really bad. So how many of you have gone on diets, any type of diet, where you've eaten a certain way, where you've lost a lot of weight and had a lot of energy doing that? Yeah, okay. There comes a time in that diet where either you start to plateau on the weight loss, okay, or you can't maintain that anymore because you start to run out of energy, okay? So again, your body is saying, okay, I need sugar going to my brain 24-7, right? Does everybody realize you need glucose going to your brain to keep it alive? Okay. So if I'm not eating enough calories or I'm not eating enough carbs um, or I'm skipping meals or I'm fasting, okay, I'm not going to get the sugar that I need. And when that happens and I get hypoglycemic, well, is hypoglycemia compatible with life? It is not. Okay, so if your body didn't come to your rescue, <laughs> it can't, it's not going to tell you you need to eat because it's, when you're, when you're fasting or not eating enough, you actually put out chemicals like adrenaline, which is, which is a very energizing chemical, but it's also an appetite suppressant. Okay, so you actually feel like, oh, this is great, my appetite is down. Again, I'm only going to eat when I'm hungry, right, so I'm not going to eat now and I have good energy, and I'm even better, I'm losing weight. Isn't that the whole goal? Okay. Well, again, today you're going to learn that losing weight by breaking down is the wrong way to lose weight. You always want to, you always want to lose weight or be your ideal body composition because you are building. Okay. And the energy that it takes to build is what's going to get you to lose weight. Yes, it's a slower weight loss but it's the only type of healthy weight loss that there is, okay? And we'll talk more about that. All right, so back to science. Everything that, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in biochemistry. The nice thing about biochemistry is it's immutable, right? I mean, these are the laws of biochemistry, if you will. So we don't come out changing biochemical pathways every other day like we do, you know, with, with, you know, oh, here's a new study that says you should do this, and here's a new study that says you, sh you should do that. Um, 25 years ago, because I had been doing this type of metabolic medicine for that long, uh, I moved to Santa Barbara, California, and uh, within a year or two, I pretty much had a big target on my back. <laughs> and I started this big diabetes clinic, and it was all about changing diet and exercise, et cetera, et cetera, and the doctors in the town um, wanted to, for, hmm, I, I'm going to say tar and feather me, okay, in a way, really, because this was new to them. And so they asked me to do grand rounds, okay. Now, in my mind, I thought, okay, they're not doing that because they go, wow, she really knows what she's doing, right? They were all going to gang up on me <laughs> during this forum, and they were going to start attacking. So I said, well, I'm a little bit smarter than that. I'm going to give them a biochemistry lecture. And that's what I did. I went through glycolysis, glycogenolysis, uh, you know, the Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, and I started to show them the biochemical pathways, which is what I used when I treated my patients and why I was asking them to change their diets, et cetera, et cetera. Well, 
prior to that, I had been practicing or thinking about what could they ask me, and here's my you know, pithy response to that. And I have to admit that I did not think of the one question that I was asked first. So after this, you know, st you know standing room only, it was pretty interesting. It was the most well-received, I shouldn't say well-received, most well-attended <laughs> <laughs> lecture, even to this day in Santa Barbara, uh, it was standing room only. And at the end of my lecture, which again, this is all about Leninger and biochemical pathways and nothing about, you know, Diana says or this is what I believe in, right? I get a question, and the question was, where are your double-blind, placebo-controlled studies to prove what you are showing me today? I almost fell over. But I also finally, for the first time, understood what the problem was. Doctors don't believe the science. They want to study. And I'm thinking, you can't do a double-blind, placebo-controlled study. There's too many variables. Okay? It's never going to happen. So now we're going to say, we're going to just ignore the biochemistry, the physiology, the endocrinology, everything that's known, because you want me to perform a study before you believe what we're doing? I mean, does that, does that sound ludicrous to you? Okay. That, that, that's 25 years ago. We're still there. We're still there. That, nothing's really changed. However, so I said, click, 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 trying to think really quickly. I said, okay, hmm, well, I'll be honest, there aren't any, okay? However, here's the science, right? So I don't have a study, but I have the science. Where are your double-blind, placebo-controlled <laughs> studies? <laughs> Telling me, you know, because you're doing something that I'm doing differently, right? So where are your studies? You don't have the science because I have the science, so you must have the studies. Do you know how quiet that room got? <laughs> it was pretty impressive. It was very funny. And I have to say, I've, I've always been very good at, at thinking quickly on my feet, but I was very proud of that one. <laughs> Literally silence, and, I, then I, and then I threw out the challenge. Okay, no one's coming up with a study. Here's my number. Anybody who finds this, you know, go now and do your literature searches, because obviously you weren't prepared, okay? And get back to me. Nobody called. I know that surprises you. <laughs> but that's what you have to understand. So we're, we're, we're wanting to have studies about something we can't study because to do a double-blind, placebo-controlled, you have to have very few parameters. Everything has to be just so, okay? You can't do them. Yes? I love what you're saying, and I, and I love what the, the fact that you believe in biochemistry because I think that's where it's at, too. But I, I don't think we should say that there are no studies because in bio, but the, what we should say is in biochemistry, science is done in a different way. You go into a lab and you find out what happens when you put these chemicals together and what the reactions are. Right. So, so, and that's how we know, that's we, why we have agreement among biochemists. And so those same reactions occur in our gut, in our cells. That's right. Wherever it is. And so there's plenty of experimentation. There's plenty of studies in biochemistry they're just not these double blind, so forth and so oh, on. Oh, yeah. Which is just like, and your answer was perfect because, you know, there's been studies that only 20% of the treatments we get in mainstream medicine are evidence based. Oh, right. So right, I'll right. stop right there. Well, thank you. And, and basically, that's what I was saying. I'm, when I say there's no studies, I meant there are no double blind, placebo controlled studies. Yes, you, you and I are on the same page on that. I didn't make that clear enough. But absolutely, because that's what I said. I said, you're going to argue with the biochemistry? <laughs> you know, this is very interesting. Th this is frightening. Okay, so again, I'm coming from biochemistry, I'm coming from endocrinology. We know what these hormones do in the body. Now, do we know everything about every hormone? No, but we know a lot. We know a lot. In fact, we know so much that there's a lot of things we can predict, and I have predicted 25 years ago that studies have, you know, shown to be true 25 years later. So we'll touch upon those as well. But anyway, just as you're saying, you're putting two biochemicals together under the same circumstances, and we're going to keep getting the same reactions. There's nothing purer than science, okay? I absolutely agree. All right, so now we turn to the 360 integrated view, if you will. And basically, please realize your body is one big chemistry set, okay? You are a bag of chemicals. Excuse the word bag, but you really are. <laughs> And your biochemicals are constantly interacting with each other 
all the time. Okay? For good or bad, they're interacting. Okay? Nothing in physiology happens in a vacuum. Right? So again, when my patients come in and they say, oh, I want to know why this happened. It's never one thing why that happened. Okay? There's going to be lots of ways to get to the same pathways, which we'll talk about that. And change begets change. So one change that happens in my physiology will affect another change and so on down the pathways. Okay. And as I said earlier, there's no such thing as heart health, if you will, or brain health. This is all about compartments, and we can't compartmentalize anything. And that goes to hormones also. I will tell you that you know there's a lot of physicians out there who still say, oh, here is the estrogen system, or here is the insulin system, or here is the adrenal system, and guess what? It's all one system. There's no such thing as the estrogen system, the adrenal system, or the insulin system. So these are biochemicals that talk to each other all the time. Now, I was hoping for a whiteboard because I like to scribble, but um, what you, you, what's that? It's behind the screen. Okay. Well, well, I'll get to that when I do really want that because I won't <laughs> bore you, but you can kind of see this. So if you think of your body as a system of systems and everybody's interacting, okay, you can look at me and go, oh, here's the stick figure of, of Dr. Schwartzbein and her head's up here and her feet are down there and everything in between. But that's not how I look at the body. I look at it as a bunch of, you know, wires that are crossing and everybody's talking to each other and my brain is talking to my heart, which is talking to my kidneys and my livers, and it's all one thing, okay? So it's intermeshed, if you will, okay? So stop thinking about your brain in your head and your stomach in your abdomen, okay? And your ovaries and your pelvis. Everybody is talking to each other and the chemicals, that connect everything are hormones slash neurotransmitters, but to me neurotransmitters are hormones released by neurons. Okay, so we're still talking about chemicals. And what are chemicals that, excuse me, what are hormones? They are chemical communicators, right? They are the chemicals that tell your cells what to do. Okay, and they talk to each other. So now we pull out the endocrine system, if you will, and look at all these chemicals, and then we start to realize, wow, they're interconnected too, okay? We don't have silos, we don't have silos. So you can't measure a hormone and go, oh yeah, now let me fill up the tank to a certain level, okay? If you start looking at the body as numbers and filling up numbers, you are gonna create hormone imbalances. So again, I want you to think in systems, not in silos, okay? And you can also think if all it takes is one hormone to be off, right? What happens if one hormone is off? That communication, which is an imbalance, ripples through the whole body, doesn't it? Okay. And if I then have my whole hormone system off, what do you think my, the rest of my body's doing? Okay. My brain isn't working as well. My heart's not working as well. My liver's not working as well. Okay. Does that cause you just to keel over and die? No, thank goodness, right? Because your body's trying to compensate for that and keep you alive. Okay, which again, um, I don't know if I stress it enough, but your body, by the way, could care less if you feel good. Okay, it's going to make you feel good initially because it's going to try to compensate. But at some point, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to have symptoms and conditions. I can't tell you how many people come to me and say I have no energy, you know, and you know, uh, or I'm achy all over, or you know, why is my hair falling out? Why am I gaining weight? And I said, well, that's your body trying to keep you alive. Thank your body now, okay? Because obviously you are the one giving your body the signals that it's dying, okay? And it can't compensate for everything, so what do you think it's gonna compensate for? How beautiful you look, you know? Or keeping your heart beating and sugar going to your brain and your blood pressure from going too low, right? All right, so treat the cause, not the symptoms, right? Heartburn, how many of you have ever experienced heartburn? Okay, how many of you have taken anti-acids to just treat that and not thought about it? Shame on you, no, I'm just teasing. <laughs> Get up here right now for your spanking. Okay, um, what about bloating after you eat or joint pain or stiffness, right? Or just a feeling of anxiousness, maybe getting some headaches, right? Well, a lot of times we either ignore this or we just take something for it, right? 
versus saying, why do I have that? Okay. Sometimes it'll just be, one, you know, that only happened once, who cares? Okay. But if you're constantly getting headaches and you are taking aspirin for that or caffeine for that or any of, you know, um, the triptans for that, you kind of start wondering what else is going on in your body, right? Because it's not okay to have a headache. A headache is a systemic problem. It's not just emanating in your head. Okay. So again, think of all of these symptoms as systemic. You might feel them in one part of your body or the other, but it's created by a, a physiology, by a chemistry that's out of balance. Otherwise, you wouldn't have that problem. Okay. Um, so again, I want you to start thinking of these as warning signs. My favorite. All right. I took a lot of nutrition courses in college. That's because I thought I was going to be a biochemist and study nutrition before I went to medical school. So when I went to medical school, I didn't realize that we didn't get nutrition because I thought everybody was taking nutrition. <laughs> so I came in with this whole appreciation of how important food is, not realizing that a lot of my cohorts, you know, training with me had no idea, right? But I should have had a clue because, you know, I trained at LA County, USC, and there was this terrible cafeteria in the county hospital, <laughs> which I'm very proud to say in nine years of training there, I never ate at once. So I would bring my own food, you know, and I'd sit with everybody and eat. But here would be everybody going in there, and I'm telling you, this was just the greasiest spoon you're ever going to visit. And the doctors were just like, free food, free food, you know, and just getting all this free food and getting heartburn from eating this. So what do you think they did next? But even better, they walked across to the auditorium to drug day where they got free antiacids. <laughs> yeah. And then come over, and I would watch this and think, Oh boy, these are the physicians of America. You know, <laughs> I mean, this is, there's a problem here, right? If you if you're going to treat symptoms that you're creating with medications, what are you going to tell your patients? You know, it's kind of scary, really. All right. So what we don't want to just do is take drugs. Now sometimes you have to. Okay? I used to work in an intensive care unit, in a coronary care unit. You came in to my unit, you would be pumped full of drugs because I would try to keep you alive. Okay? But there are, is no place for chronic ambulatory drugs, in my opinion. Okay? Because if you've ever read the PDR, it's a very scary book. Okay? It's a horror story. <laughs> you know? So you, yes, you can use them judiciously. Yes, they have a place. Sometimes you know, people have to use them. Like if you have high blood pressure, I'm not going to let you run around with high blood pressure, you can promote a stroke. But I'm also not going to just say, take this drug, oh good, your blood pressure is lowered, we don't have to do any work. No, now we have to do the work to say, why did you have the high blood pressure in the first place? It's not because you had a deficiency of the blood pressure medication, right? <laughs> Something happened. Something happened. Okay, so we're going to treat the underlying causes, and today you're going to realize that this is all about metabolism and a damaged metabolism that causes all these conditions. Okay. All right, and I think I already touched upon that disease is a continuum, right? So as Jonathan mentioned in, in the intro, we used to die of infectious diseases and in industrial accidents and childbirth and a lot of things that we're going to call external, right? And we're not saying we eliminated all of this, but we pretty much have it under control. But now we're going to die mostly from chronic disease. And here's the scary thing. Chronic disease is occurring earlier and earlier. Okay. We used to say the degenerative diseases of aging. Okay. Well, 30-year-olds having heart attacks, 12-year-olds being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. A lot of the initial work that I did in my clinical research, if you will, was on type 2 diabetes. As an endocrinologist, that's the bread and butter of endocrinology, if you will. So I remember you know, the, pa uh, the patients coming in to me and, and working with them, and I was just Back then, by the way, some of the signs I'm going to show you today, we didn't even know, okay? But so we were scrambling to try to guess, like, what was going on, because I could either believe that this was a degenerative disease that you couldn't do anything about, right? Or that, wait a minute, we might be missing the boat here. Maybe it's what we're asking the patients to do isn't the right thing, right? And by the way, 25 years ago, we were in the high-carb, low-fat movement, okay? Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> However, I'm going to say, Ugh, today we're in the high protein, low carb movement. Even worse. Okay. And you're going to find out why that's even worse. Okay. But anyway, basically, dur during this time with, with my work with type 2 diabetes, 
I said, if we do not change what we are doing today, not only you know what causes diabetes, but in the treatment of diabetes, we are going to, in 10 or 15 years, see type 2 diabetes in our children. And I was ten, 5 to 10 years off. It was earlier than I thought. Within 5 or 10 years of me stay, seeing that or thinking that, we started to see type 2 diabetes in, the, in our teenagers and in our kids. And it is, it's a very sad state of affair when you see that. Okay, so unlike the infectious diseases, again, degenerative diseases of aging, do they just pop up? No, there are, they are years in the making, okay? Any of you who are skipping breakfast right now are, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to pick on you, but since you already raised your hand, <laughs> and I have your name, no. Um, I need you to stop that behavior right now. You're gonna create disease. Okay, but again, it starts off with imbalances in the hormone systems from what I'm doing, and that leads to symptoms. The symptoms, if I don't do anything about them, and I just treat them with drugs, and the physiology continues, it erodes, right? So this is, this is hard to see, okay? How many people can say, oh, here I am at age 20, really healthy, and oh, I don't feel like eating breakfast, and I'm, you know, I'm busy, and never ate breakfast. And all of a sudden, at age 40, oh, guess what you have? Type 2 diabetes. Okay? I used to tell my patients with diabetes, my working title of my diabetic book is, oh, but I never ate breakfast. Okay? Because I would hear that over and over again. Okay? So when I first started working with patients, and believe me, I, I trained at a county hospital. Okay? There wasn't a lot of getting to talk to patients at that point in time. So really my first experience with understanding what was going on versus just being told how the body works you know, in medical school was when I sat down and started listening to my patients and I kept hearing the same story. I'm gonna tell you now, 25 years later, there hasn't been one patient with type 2 diabetes who says, well, I did everything right, how come I have type 2 diabetes? Never have heard that, okay? I've heard people thinking they're doing the right thing, like skipping breakfast because they're not hungry and they're listening to their bodies, okay? Uh, but that kind of physiology breaks you down and can lead to type 2 diabetes, especially if you have genetic predisposition for it, okay? Will everybody who skips breakfast end up with type 2 diabetes? No. You can, you can have a heart attack from doing that. <laughs> you can have Alzheimer's dementia from doing that, okay? So it's, it's again, you know, when we talk about disease being a metabolic disorder, Okay, it's 90% what you do and 10% your genetics, which again we'll talk a little bit about. Okay, so I, you know, usually it's going to be well in my family if everybody's doing it wrong we get diabetes, <laughs> or in the, somebody else's family it could be heart disease or Al Alzheimer's dementia, or if you're unlucky all three. Right, we see that a lot. <laughs> That's when you get really pissed at your parents. Okay, what about hormones regulating your metabolism? So remember we talked about building and using reactions, okay? I don't know if you're, you're aware, but you cannot build if your building hormones are not higher than your using hormones at any given moment. You will not build, okay? You can eat, that doesn't mean you're building, okay? So you need to understand what are the things that are gonna get my building hormones higher than my using hormones. And then, of course, are we trying to get rid of the using side of the metabolism? No, because that's what keeps me alive and functioning, right? So we want to build so we can use, right? All right, everybody stand up again. And stretch, and stretch, and stretch. And sing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you know what? Um, I'll get Well, I'm just going to get this one here. Thanks, Donnie. <laughs> keep, keep going. I say you can sit down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, good, 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 good. All right, so building and using are under hormonal control, and there are building hormones, and there are using hormones, and there, guess what, is a hierarchy of hormones. Okay, the major rebuilding hormone of your body is called insulin. Has everybody heard of insulin? Okay, how many of you are afraid of insulin? Okay, 
Well, when you're going on low-carb diets, you are lowering your insulin levels. So we're going to talk more about that. Okay. So insulin is your friend, and today we're going to talk about how it's your best friend. It is the major anti-aging hormone of the body, since aging is losing the ability to rebuild and repair. So if you've ever heard that as we all age, we get more insulin resistant, insulin resistance means your body's not responding well to insulin. Okay, and that's what aging really is. Okay, losing the ability to rebuild as well. Okay, and what about using? Well, there's pretty much three major using hormones. Adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol. Okay, now, when I use the term major, that means there must be minor, right? <laughs> so there are minor hormones. For instance, thyroid hormones help insulin rebuild you. Human growth hormone is a minor hormone that helps insulin rebuild you. It is not the major hormone. It's the I don't know why we call it human growth hormone <laughs> instead of insulin being human growth. You know what I'm saying? The names are confusing. But it's not. And how do we know that? Well, you can have zero levels of human growth hormone in your body and still be alive. Can you have zero levels of insulin and still be alive? No. What happens? How do we diagnose type 1 diabetes? Type 1 diabetes is the inability to make insulin, right? The patients are wasting away, right? They're breaking down rapidly. Okay. They eat and eat and eat, and they lose weight. Of course, initially, they're really excited about that, right? And then later on, they realize, wow, something's wrong because I'm really not able to hold this, okay? So that's how we know insulin is your primary or your major building hormone. There isn't another hormone that you take away that does that, okay? Now, you can have excessive adrenaline, and you're going to waste away too, but that's excessive. That's not taking it away. Okay, because what's adrenaline? One of your major using hormones. So if it goes high, you're going to use and use and use and use. Okay, but what else does like noradrenaline and adrenaline do? Keeps your heart beating, right? So if they go away, that's not great. Okay, <laughs> what about cortisol? Keeps you from getting hypotensive, right? And having cardiovascular collapse. That's pretty major. Okay, so that's why I'm, I'm calling them major hormones. Now, having said that. To me, as an endocrinologist, they're all important, okay? This, the deal is, who is the most important? Who has the loudest voice, okay? So since I'm not going to make you all into junior endocrinologists, at least not in one night, right? You're going to have to go and read books, and we'll get you there. I want you to come away with just thinking that you're going to think about all the things that cause insulin to go up and all the things that cause adrenaline and cortisol and noradrenaline to go up, and then you're going to look at your lifestyle and say, am I balancing those two systems, okay? And we'll get into why it's a three to one <laughs> in a moment. All right. But again, it's the combined effects of all of these hormones at every given moment. Do you ever turn off adrenaline? No. It's always there, right? Just at different levels in your body. I don't know if you realize that, because a lot of people think it's an on or off switch, okay? But no, these hormones are always there. There's basal rates, and then there's higher rates, and there could even be higher rates than that, okay? And then if you make tumor, if you have tumors that make them, then you can even get into higher levels of that. But real endocrine disorders, so tumors that overproduce hormones, are very rare. So that's not usually what we're seeing in clinical practice. We're seeing habits that are causing imbalances in the hormones. And that's why we're saying it's under your control most of the time. Okay, so again, to reiterate, you cannot be in building and using mode at the same time. However, I can be highly, highly, highly using, and then my body's going, oh my goodness, I better compensate for that or I'm going to be highly, highly, highly dead, right? Okay, because you can see here, right, building and using, right? If it looks like this, how long do you think you're going to live? Okay, so what does your body do? It starts to try to make more insulin and keep it higher to try to be a stopgap for you, okay? And so what do we start seeing in the bloodstream when that happens? We start seeing high insulin levels. And then we start seeing disease, and who do we blame? Insulin, when it had nothing to do with insulin. Insulin was keeping you alive. It's keeping you from breaking down and killing yourself. Insulin is the innocent bystander that's been getting all the bad rap, okay? And it's really adrenaline and cortisol 
a noradrenaline that's killing you. Okay? We can talk more about that. Okay, so metabolism is about building and using, and now you know you want to balance those out. And now you know that there's hormones that determine that. What determines your hormones? Oh, back to your habits, <laughs> okay? So it's going to be all about nutrition and all that good stuff, okay? So the way I'm eating, how I'm handling stress, how much sleep I'm getting, what other kind of chemicals am I getting exposed to or putting in my body, what type of movement and activity that I do, that determines my hormones as long as all my hormone systems are intact, okay? That goes out the window if I do have a gland problem. For instance, in menopause, okay? Menopause is the permanent loss of the sex hormone system, not temporary, okay? So anybody here who's in menopause, not on hormone therapy, done correctly, is actually in more breakdown mode than building mode, which we're gonna talk more about. That's why we say menopause is a time of accelerated aging for women, okay? And we see that. Okay, so again, nutrition, it's not just what you eat, it's actually how you eat it. It's how you combine your foods. What kind of ratios of your complex carb to protein are you eating, okay? Are you sitting down? Are you relaxed? Are you chewing your food? Or are you standing around throwing things in your mouth, multitasking, okay? Because you cannot digest in sympathetic mode, okay? So if you're running around, your body's not gonna digest. And I'm sure you've heard lectures in here before, or I'm only surmising, that if you're not digesting your food and undigested food is reaching your small intestine, you are having immune reactions to that food because that's where your immune system begins, if you will. Okay? And we'll talk more about that. It's not just stress because we're all stressed. Okay? It's actually your response to stress. Okay? If you get so stressed that you skip meals, <laughs> and you drink alcohol, or you smoke cigarettes, or you know, whatever you're doing to, to help you with the stress, or you're just too stressed to even think about that, then your stress and how, you know, how you're handling that stress can actually propagate stress, right, and make it even worse. But it's also the emotional component of that. How many of you think that you do a very good job handling stress? How many of you think you do a very bad job of handling stress? How many of you don't know if you do a good or bad job? <laughs> Which is good, that's more honest. <laughs> but I also want to change the, the definition of stress with you today, okay? It's really not emotional because there's a lot of physical stresses that occur, okay? So we'll get, back, we'll get to that too. How much sleep and how deep of sleep Okay, and are you cycling into stage three and four, right? Or do you go, oh, I sleep well because I take Ambien at night and it knocks me out, okay? Or, my favorite, you gotta realize, they don't teach us a lot about how to interview a patient, you know, for habits, right? Because we don't, habits aren't important. <laughs> so when I first started working with my diabetic patients, the first thing I'd say to you, so do you have a good diet? Oh yeah, and I'd go, oh good, you know. <laughs> and I would move on to the next question, you know, do you sleep well? Yeah, really well, you know. But didn't, and it didn't even occur to me that everybody had their own idea what that meant, you know. So when I couldn't find any rhyme or reason for what was going on, I started thinking, maybe I should be digging a little deeper. And then I was appalled to find out what they thought was eating well or sleeping well, okay. My favorite is, oh, yeah, I sleep great. You know, okay, great, what time do you go to bed? Well, I go to sleep, I'm in bed at 10.30, and then I toss and turn for, you know, half an hour to 40 minutes, and then I finally fall asleep, Oh, yeah, and then I wake up a couple hours later, and I go to the bathroom, and then I come back, and then I think a few things, and then I go, you know, and I would hear the story going, I would almost scream, because if I wake up once and look at the clock and fall right back to sleep, that is the worst night's sleep I've ever had, okay? So, it's important to understand that you're not supposed to be waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, and no, you won't pee in your pants, okay, if, if you sleep through the night, because that's when a lot of my patients get worried. But if you make me sleep through the night, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pee in my pants. You know, I said, no, you're, you're going to the bathroom because you're out of balance. There's something going on with you. You should be able to lie down for eight hours and not have to get up to urinate, okay? So something is going wrong if that's not happening. So let me rephrase this now. 
how many of you <laughs> go to sleep, hit the pillow, fall asleep very easily without taking drugs, okay? Stay asleep for eight hours and wake up refreshed. <laughs> okay, so the rest of you are sleep deprived, okay? And there is a reason for that. And if you are not sleeping, which is the time your body uses to rebuild, then you are what? Using and breaking down more, which means you're accelerating your aging by not sleeping, and that's not okay. Now, this is not a commercial for Ambien, okay? I do not believe in sleeping pills, okay? Because sleeping pills do not put you into restorative deep sleep. In fact, they make that even worse. They cycle you out of that. Okay, so we're not saying, oh God, okay, now I'm gonna go and ask my doctor for a prescription, right? We're gonna go back and say, why aren't you sleeping? What's going on biochemically that does not let you sleep? And you are not allowed to answer that you're getting older, okay? Because <laughs> that doesn't work, okay? So something is keeping you from sleeping biochemically, okay? And we're gonna, you know, we gotta figure out what that is. And we'll talk more about that. So again, chemicals, okay, caffeine and sugar and alcohol and nicotine and tobacco and hard street drugs and every prescription medication on the planet, okay? These are all gonna be what I'm gonna call toxic chemicals, okay? But they're also what people use to keep themselves going, right? These are the self-medicating chemicals that people go, wow, if I don't have my coffee, I cannot think, or I don't have energy, okay? Or I can't move, or I'm achy, whatever that is. So if you are reaching for chemicals to make yourself feel better, there is something wrong with your metabolism, okay? And if you can say, okay, but as long as I'm having my three cups of coffee, I'm fine, then you are not addressing the underlying issue of why you need to have three cups of coffee which will then become four cups of coffee, and then five. And then one day, the coffee won't work anymore because you've done nothing to fix why you needed it to begin with, okay? So we're not gonna pull coffee away from you or caffeine, okay? But you're gonna start rebuilding your chemistry so that one day you rebuild your chemistry so that you can use again and you don't need caffeine to bolster you up, okay? How many of you drink something with caffeine in it on a daily basis? Okay, so, and again, it depends on how much, and a lot of people say, oh, but I like the taste of coffee, and then I say, great, then have it decaf, and then they go, oh, no. <laughs> so it's really not the taste. <laughs> um, so again, you have to now, uh, the, why I'm bringing this up is you're the ones who has to start asking the question about yourself, right? Okay, because how many doctors are gonna sit down and ask you all of these things that we're talking about today? Okay, yeah. so, none. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's, there's functional medicine doctors who will do some of that, but yes, in general, very few, okay? So guess what? You've gotta take control, right? That's why we're teaching you all this, so that you can take control of your own health. Okay, what about movement and exercise? Movement and exercise changes hormones, doesn't it? And then of course, hormones help me move and exercise. So it's a two-way street, just like everything else. Which reminds me, can everybody stand up, please? And after this next slide, this will be a great time, I think, for a break, okay? So basically what I wanna say there for, okay, I'm hoping that you're starting to understand that you are in control, or you will be in control, or probably you haven't been in control, but now you're going to be in control, right? Okay, um, but you will only be healthy if you're smart, okay? And smart means you do have to know how it works. And no, you don't have to know the biochemical pathways to the degree that I know them, okay? And sometimes I forget them and have to look them up again, okay? But you do have to understand, is what I'm doing making me build right now or making me use right now, okay? And if you do that and you are left with kind of saying, how do I balance those two systems out? You are already starting to take charge, okay? So after the break, we're gonna learn how it all works. <laughs>